Not all of you. So my name is Sally Chang. Um, I host the uh, Evergreen Tai Chi Academy. I'm the founder and the chief instructor, and a lot of you are patrons. And so that's our online learning site. I'm also an acupuncturist and an herbalist, and um, and I've known Jean Viev for a long time. I, I don't know, is it that we actually met Jean? Well, I, I think that's part of it. And then we had some paired patients, and then we took the classical Chinese course together. Uh, right, right. Yeah, many different ways. <laughs> many ways that we have seen each other and become really good friends over the years. Yeah. And, um, and so, yes, we, we have a shared love for Chinese medicine and um, also the deeper philosophy behind Chinese medicine. So not just the, the most recent incarnation of Chinese medicine, which is called TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, but also we've both had different teachers um, that we've studied with going into the classics, the classical Chinese medicine, which is Chinese medicine has been around for thousands of years. So you can imagine that it's had to go through many iterations of uh, responding to the moment at hand. So Chinese medicine is this very moment responding to the coronavirus at this time, you know, the epidemic disease that crops up in the moment. So it's a living tradition, right? It has a long history, but is always continually evolving. And um, Jean Viev is a um, specialist in pregnancy and, um, and she is an incredible herbalist. I think herbal, herbal medicine is probably your, your first passion, right? Um, both Western and Eastern, but especially Eastern medicine. She's studied with, um, well, maybe I can give it, give it over to you. So you, you graduated sure. from Santa Barbara and the Oakland School and you yes. studied further, right? Yes, that's right. Well, my first calling was as a, an ecologist. So that was my mm -hmm. undergrad. And um, because I've always felt very drawn to nature. And, um, but I always also had an interest in natural healing and um, ended up um, needing it for myself and had the epiphany after it worked really well that that's what I wanted to do. And um, when I started studying the classics, so much of it is rooted in nature and uh, observing um, natural rhythms that it, it really surprised me. But in, in some, some way, ecology was actually the perfect preparation to dive into the Chinese classics because I would read these ancient texts and realize, oh, wow, this is what I've been seeing in the fields all these years. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And, um, and it makes perfect sense. So but I, so I went on to go to acupuncture school and then uh, participated in um, or took um, for about five years of postgraduate studies after I was done in um, programs that were specializing in the classics. And I also hosted a number of um, continuing education programs on the theme of the Chinese classics and particularly herbal formulation. And um, so that classical herbal medicine at large is mostly my specialty. And then within that, I do have particular predilection for treating um, pregnant women. And I work with local midwives and, um, and really enjoy it. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, jean -Viev. Just giving you the, for giving us the brief overview on your um, many years of study. And um, I just wanted to read from your website because I think it's quite beautiful. Um, jean Viev writes, um, classical Chinese medicine views the human body as a microcosm of the universe. Therefore, the health of the planet is inseparable from ours. In keeping with the highest precepts of classical Chinese medicine canons, a good doctor seeks to understand physiology in an ecological fashion and to honor the roots of these insights by the observation and protection of the natural rhythms. So I think that really speaks to your, uh, your paradigm, your point of view as, a, as an environmentalist and ecologist, um, and also as a, as a humanist that is really so devoted to um, the, the betterment of humanity and human health and what our topic is for today, which is 
viewing the environment and the oncology, how the seasons and the environment move us, how we're influenced by all of us, you know, as humans all throughout the globe influenced by um, the world seasons and also how those seasons are in our bodies as well. So the macrocosm and the microcosm together. And this is really uh, one of the key precepts of um, classical Chinese medicine, but not just Chinese medicine, you see these same overlay of these systems. So you have Chinese medicine, you also have feng shui, you also have Taoism, and you have um, all these, like they, they form these layers where they're separate fields, but actually there's like, it's like a Venn diagram where they meet in the middle. Um, and this paradigm of how the seasonal, the seasons change and how our planet moves through the cosmos and is influenced by the cosmos is something that influences all of these fields. Wouldn't you say, jean vive Right. Um, so, you know, for, for the ancient Chinese who didn't have, um, you know, the modern astronomical observation methods that we have, but who were still quite advanced in astronomical observations, um, celestial events took place from the perspective of where you were standing. So um, the understanding of the world was very much egocentric and geocentric, where you, from where you were, you would see the sun rise on one side and go to the zenith and set on the other side. And um, you would see the constellations move around you throughout the seasons. And, um, and natural phenomena would change um, seemingly as a result, or at least in correspondence. And so for Chinese uh, medicine, um, a central theme is how to harmonize with changing times. And so time, space, and medicine are really very much the same thing in Chinese medicine, meaning that mm -hmm. our own bodily energy responds to the environment and to some degree rides upon it. So when, when the sun rises in the morning, your chi rises, your eyes open. Um, during, um, in the spring, the same thing happens. Those plants start growing, energy starts to grow and reaches its apex um, around um, the, the And then um, the chi starts returning to its root and settling down with, you know, you can observe in nature fruits falling in, on a daily cycle level, you see the sun setting and um, things are just returning to the earth and to storage. And so we, we experience all these rhythms on a daily level, on a seasonal level, and even on the level of one breath where, um, and Sally probably knows much more about this than me as a Qigong master, but just in, in the act of bringing in breath and bringing it down uh, to nourish and then exhaling and bringing forth that spring energy um, of what we put out into the world. So they, there are many different time units on which the same circular motion of energy is happening. And for Chinese medicine, be it um, in the form of herbal medicine, where we move qi with flavors, or dietary therapy, also using flavors, or acupuncture, where we use needles, or qigong, where we use movement and breath. Um, the aim is to put the human being back into this natural time, meaning that when you're in illness, it's because you're either too fast or too slow, and you need to be put back on time. Um, so that, that, that is sort of Chinese medicine 101. <laughs> um, yeah, I love how you spoke about that because um, often our Western point of view is, is so much about um, betterment, getting better, getting ourselves better or making ourselves better than others. Was that basically the tenets of Chinese medicine is basically putting us back into a natural harmonious time and an alignment um, with the natural cycles of nature. That's that, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I know you wanted to talk a little about what's happening right now too with this season and 
Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about the overview of the seasonal changes in the annual cycle of time. Um, Because this is, it's something that we're all very familiar with. And yet, when it comes, it's like, we're still surprised. (laughs) Go, it was just, it was just springtime, and it was kind of cool. And now, boom, it's all, it's summer, or all of a sudden, summer has ended. And now we're going into some colder weather. And so we're, we're constantly influenced and um, by our environmental change just in our, in our local climate, but also just in the wider seasonal climate as well. So if we talk about the, the seasonal change and the movement of yin and yang, so as we are moving towards the summer solstice, we are, we're actually well into summer. Right, so uh, summer actually began on May the 5th in the Chinese Qi notes calendar. Um, and so, whereas in the West, we might think of summer as just beginning because, you know, maybe school is out and vacation is starting or things like that. Uh, often we think of Memorial Day um, in America, we think of that as sort of like the beginning of summer, uh, which is just coming up on Monday. But um, in terms of Chinese medicine, we've, we've already been in summer. You hit the solstice, that's like the peak of summer. That is summer at its apex. So it's what we would call the yang of the yang. So the yin of the yang would be the rising up to the summer solstice. By the time you get there, it's the yang of the yang, right? So it's like uh, on the yin yang symbol, it would be the white side is the yang side and the black side is the yin side it would be like the fish's head the fish's head the white fish's head would be the peak of the yang and when you reach the peak of the yang at the summer solstice there is the eye of the fish which is the seed of the yin so the moment we pass the moment we cruise past the peak of the yang of the yang at the solstice Yang begins to wane gently, it might be imperceptible to most people, um, but the seed of yin has already been planted and yin is going to be growing and yang will be slowly going, getting ready for bed. <laughs> and so that's kind of the, the season that we're in right now. You have anything to add to that, Jean-Vierre? Yeah, well, I would yeah, say I this would is say something we see in the garden even or out in nature. We see that for the past couple of months, you know, pe- a lot of people have been gardening more with the, the whole quarantine thing. And, you know, we, so seedlings come up. And if you notice over the past two weeks or so, um, everything is just getting so much more foliage and the growth rate is really, um, really much faster than before. So we see this acceleration of the upward movement of yang. And Mm. at the same time, we start noticing the first green plums coming up on tree green berries, and um, they will be ready. Probably, you know, the traditional time for all these summer fruit to start coming around is, is is right around the summer solstice and then they start falling to the earth signaling exactly what what you were talking about which is the that ever slightly no, noticeable return of yin and going back down toward the root of, toward the earth really when it comes to natural things and um, I think that you know as the energy of yang rises people see a variety of possible um, um, ailments or just feelings come up in their lives there are some that are positive and naturally associated with um, with that expanded yang state like for Chinese medicine it's associated with the heart and joy and mm. um, the feeling of levity and energy but the the, the reverse of the coin is that if it's not controlled, it could be too much upward movement. And so some people who have a propensity to um, upward dispersion, be it, you know, like uh, anxiety or maybe insomnia or palpitations or sudden and excessive sweating, like those people might notice that these things are getting worse in this season. And so it's important to then call on... um, on the opposite energy of just 
keeping things contained and inward and um, on the opposite. So that would be a person who compared to nature is going too fast. Like the energy of nature is coming up, but the person is already has shot up way past the zenith and is having all these symptoms of yang rising. And conversely, if a person is going too slow compared to nature, they might have issues where the young of nature is increasing and people should naturally be more active. There's more light, the flowers are coming out, etc. But those people have a hard time getting up in the morning or they feel depressed or they just, just don't have quite that joy that, that should be there in this season. And then mm. you want to do the opposite and try to kind of bring them out of their shell. And that, that can be done with flavors in food. Um, that can be done with movement. Um, all sorts of things. Yeah. So that's just um, that's a wonderful talk about the uh, the summer season and the heart. So the heart is the organ that is associated with the summer season. And I just want to give you the overview of the organ associations with each of the seasons. Right. So if we begin in the springtime, spring is associated with wood. And that would be the liver and gallbladder energy. So that's like the energy of like the sprout, the young sprout breaking up from the earth. It takes a lot of energy, but that energy is quite tender. So that's yang on the rise, right? And so it's liver gallbladder energy. So as we go into summer, we're going to go into the fire organs. So the fire organs, the primary one would be the heart. You know? Its associated organ would be the small intestine, and also the uh, pericardium and the triple burner. As we go into the autumn, that would be the associated organ systems would be the lungs and the large intestine. And then as we go into winter, that would be the kidney and the urinary bladder. So you see how we go through this cycle and each season has like a, an organ system that is kind of like uh, in the front row of the classroom, you know, the energy is up and available. So to come back to where we're at right now in the summer, that would be the, uh, the primary uh, monarch of our body system, our organ system would be the heart, right? And so that goes back to what jean Viev was talking about of what can be exacerbated during this time. Um, the heart's primary um, positive emotion would be joy a joyfulness. And I would also say um, its characteristic is benevolence. And um, when, uh, when there is, say, too, too much joy, you can, you can see this sometimes happening when there's like fire, heart fire is flaring up, right? Heart fire is flaring up and there's like a over propensity for, for laughing or kind of like that fire quality of being unrooted because fire itself is immaterial, right? It kind of clings to the fuel that is burning, the wood or the, the oil in the oil lamp, but it itself is like this weightless, materialless. It wants to be in the, in the air, in the atmosphere, and it's expressive and it's illuminating and bright. And so, you know, maybe we have, we have seen um, in ourselves and in our communities, uh, some things with our, uh, our emotions that have been up during this season. Um, have you seen some things in the clinic and on your consults uh, during this season, Genevieve? Well, you know, I'm seeing, well, due to the pandemic, a huge rise in anxiety and of course, you know, the season complicates that quite a bit. Um, so um, anxiety, you know, with adrenaline, this sort of flight or fright response can be shooting upwards in many of its manifestations. Like people will get, you know, palpitations or flushed or um, redness in the face. They're sweating easily, all the stress responses that we see um, uh, can be more exacerbated in the summer. So then it becomes really important, um, you know, herbally, uh, we use the sour flavor because it contains inward and it helps um, elicit 
its uh, associated element, which is the metal. And I know you were mentioning, you know, the lungs um, and um, and the intestine being associated with uh, the return of fall. And what the respiratory and digestive system have in common is that they bring elements from out the outside, air and food and water, and bring it inward and downward to create nourishment. So we want to sort of ahead of time for a person who is going too too fast compared to the normal harmonious steady growth of yang that should be happening a person who's kind of shooting way past that too fast we want to slow them down by eliciting the energy of 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 metal and the fall and returning inward so mm. we've you know herbally i've been using a lot of um of sour flavors like schizandra berries and and moistening flavors like uh like my mindong. But there's also really easy things people can do at home with food. Um, like for example, right now we see that there are, um, you know, the plums are starting to come out, the berries, these are all sour in flavor right. and they nourish the fluids, which helps contain an excessive uh, fire rushing upwards. Um, those are easy things that people could do. Bitter greens also can help because the bitter fla flavor descends in Chinese medicine. So I've been using quite a bit of that both herbally and, and also in dietary recommendations. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I would like say- when you, go to, when you go to the grocery store or you're, you don't go to the grocery store, but you're ordering online and you have it delivered to your house, depending on how you're getting your food. What is it that uh, some people could look for in the bitter and the sour category that might be helpful during this time to quell some anxiety and to kind of ground the spirit? Well, definitely, um, you know, the, the summer fruits, the plums, the berries, the, the peaches that are just starting to come out, these are all extremely moist and cooling and a little sour to all qualities that help um, keep fire in check. And the idea is not to douse fire because fire is the basis of life. I, I belong to a school of herbalism called the fire school. We're really about fire is very important. However, it shouldn't be out of control. And, um, and so, um, you know, these juicy sour fruits really help to, to nourish that time. And it's very appropriate because they're seasonal. They, they, they're coming out right now. And in terms of the greens, um, you know, they're also um, very seasonal right now. I'd say chard, kale, sorrel, if you can find it, is really wonderful because it has that sour, tangy flavor. Yeah. Um, there's also, um, for those who have gardens, borage greens are really good. Um, and um, um, let's see what else, um, you know, lettuces. For, for those who tend to feel cold, uh, which is not incompatible with some feeling of heat rushing upward, those who have cold bellies or cold feet, I would be careful about not having those greens too raw. Some of the, some of the fresh fruit is okay, but you have to watch out that in trying to cool down fire, don't cool it down too much. So I would recommend to use those greens cooked. Um, and uh, even the fruit can be cooked, actually. That could be mm -hmm. a very delicious um, sort of, um, what do you call it, compote. <laughs> yeah, compote, exactly. Right, and I, I sometimes like to think of um, the bitter flavor. You don't, like you don't need a whole plate of arugula or dandelion right. green. Like if you tend to have a colder constitution, like maybe your digestion is a little bit weak or you tend towards having a little bit of a loose stool or you get a cold back or cold feet, you know, maybe just a little bit of bitter greens would be good on the plate proportionally, you know, and then to have some other things like grains and cooked foods and other things that are, that are a little mm -hmm. bit that, uh, more towards your constitution. That's a really good point. Yeah, and I think sometimes even just meditating with the flavor, like a little bite. If you're a person who tends to um, have a cold constitution, 
-hmm. which is again not incompatible with having those feelings of heat shooting upwards because often that's just due to both yin and yang being deficient and there's a separation that happens i think um you know even just holding a piece of something bitter in your mouth without consuming large plates of it, as Sally was saying, can mm. be helpful because the way Chinese formulas work is with flavors. So when, when our brains, what a flavor does, it makes our chi move a certain way. And so holding something bitter or sour in your mouth and really feeling like, what is this feeling like? How is this affecting my bodily energy? That will have an effect in itself. Yeah, the flavors are like a, a signal to the body. The body responds to that signal in a certain way, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and there's so about many the, ways. Uh, the nourishing of the heart yin. Are there any, so the heart, uh, also needs like uh, nutritive fluids as well to stay balanced, right? That's right. So I think those, um, you know, they say in Chinese medicine, uh, the stomach is the source of fluids. And so I think we have to look at um, things that are traditionally nourishing for, for the stomach and spleen. So as you were mentioning, the grains are really important to establish um, that foundation of a of a healthy digestive system that can extract nutrients and nutritive juices from the food. Um, so, you know, um, rice particularly, but also barley, quinoa, etc. cetera. Um, um, again, the, the juicy fruits are very good. You know, in herbal medicine, you would tend to use um, herbs that are, um, that are sort of plump and juicy to achieve this. Um, so that, that can be mimicked through our use of, of, um, of fruit and grains. Um, and then I think that equally important to nourishing the yin of the heart is nourishing the yang. So we've talked a lot about people who have, you know, problems of, you know, heat escaping too much. But what about, you know, all the people who have the opposite problem where, you know, despite the world being warm and full of sun, mm -hmm. inside their inner landscape could be downcast and maybe right. quite not so much fire, especially in these difficult times where so many people are worried about their families and friends and livelihoods. And that's, you know, um, in, in that case, stimulating the heart young would be a good idea. And, um, you know, in, in Chinese medicine, we use um, a lot of cinnamon to achieve that. Cinnamon is red and has the signature of the red color of the heart and also looks like the blood vessels when you take the twigs of cinnamon. And so as such, it has an acrid flavor, spicy flavor that is warming and kind of um, brings the yang outward. So a person who, was, who is too downcast could use... Um, uh, spicy flavors to mm -hmm. help bring some of that joyful energy out, particularly cinnamon, but also ginger, um, you know, any types of curries would be good too. Uh, pepper, black pepper is also excellent for the heart. In fact, they use it for all sorts of heart pain in Chinese herbalism. Right, right. Yeah, so you see there's many different uh, scenarios and uh, unlike Western medicine, which is kind of like, everybody gets this one medicine for all of these symptoms. We're, we're always trying to address the, um, the individual constitution. So every, there are different patterns for different constitutions. So somebody who might have a propensity for a heart fire, um, you know, somebody they're related to could have a deficiency and they would get different medicine. So in other words, if somebody has a great amount of heart fire, you wouldn't be recommending them to take cinnamon every single day. But for somebody who has a deficiency, a cold back or poor digestive system, cold feet, they could be having a little bit of cinnamon a bit more often in their food or in their tea. That's yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so those are so that's our current season. 
And um, I was just listening to you talk about the, um, the food uh, that's available. Like you can go out on a walk. I mean, we're, I'm in Oakland, uh, we can go out on a walk and we can find the plum trees starting to um, really leaf out and start to develop their fruit. And you can mm -hmm. see that development of, of the fruit body. Um, and I was thinking about the, uh, the emotion, the healthy emotion of the heart being joy. And when, you, when you're intaking something, something like a ripe peach or a ripe plum or some stone fruits that are, are very juicy and how it, it does actually stimulate joy inside, inside the body, right? There's like, you have the sour flavor, you have the sweetness, you have the juiciness. If you plug it straight from the tree, you get that satisfaction of like seeing the growth process and like there's nothing like having ripe fruit straight from, straight from the tree, right? And that itself is just like really brings the joy um, just in that simple act, yeah? So true. And I remember yesterday we were having this conversation and you were mentioning the sun also. Yeah, just uh, the fact that there is more sunlight now than there was a month ago, I think has been really uplifting for a lot of us. I know it has been for me and friends that I've talked to. So, I mean, even as we have been dealing with the threat of this coronavirus, um, whether we've had it or haven't had it or somebody we know has had it, um, the fact that we've been going towards the sun, you could say, like sunlight is increasing, that we can coast on that energy and let it uplift our spirit. And it's good to let ourselves do it, you know, to not, uh, to not, uh, fight against the, the natural quality of the season, I think is one of the recommendations in Chinese medicine, to understand the season and not struggle against it, but to find your way to balance yourself with it and to recognize the energy that is abundant in the season, I think is a great way to um, bring ease into your life. That's true. Yes, I think a lot can be achieved by just being out in nature and letting all these energies pervade our beings. And truly, I think that's where a lot of the sages of antiquity got their knowledge from was just the observation of natural rhythms. And of course, we can only aspire to such deep understanding, but um, being outside in the sun and just really taking in the joy of what's happening around us is um, an excellent meditation for the heart and very appropriate for these, the time of the summer solstice. Yeah, and I think like in this uh, unusual situation that we're all in with the game, not all of us have uh, a great access to the outdoors. Some of us have more, some less, if you're in an urban area. Um, but I think it's important to try and get yourself out there and getting the sunlight hitting your eyeballs, you know, like stimulating your, your pineal gland and developing your, your melatonin so that you are, you are, you need the physicality Your your skin is, is um, able to uh, receive the sunlight and then your body is stimulated to produce vitamin D. Um, so all of, all of these things uh, which we think of are maybe very external to us, actually we re it's essential. We need that. We need that sunlight stimulation. Otherwise we'd just be living like the Jetsons. We just take a pill and then for everything. And we are, we've already figured out that that doesn't really work well enough <laughs> for us, right? So the best thing that we can do during this time is to really take care of ourselves, to know ourselves better, to identify our needs, to identify our constitutions and take care of ourselves. We don't have a cure for the coronavirus. Right? We don't have a cure for COVID-19 yet. We may, we may do someday. But the best thing that we can do right now is to promote and boost our immune system and knowing what is available to us, not fighting against it, but embracing it and receiving it um, is one of the key ways uh, that we can do this in Chinese medicine. Jean-Pierre, what, what is that principle? 
probably in the Neijing that you're more familiar with than me about like how uh, the first medicine is really food. Like with a good diet, you don't you don't need medicine. Oh, that's right. Yes, and also in the in the Mers Materia Medica, the um, yes. which is the first uh, herbal textbook that we have available to us. It's they organize medicinal substances, including foods and grains, uh, into three categories. And the it's sort of the opposite thinking as Western thinking, where we think, you know, the strongest, most potent medicine is, is the best. And for them, the so there were three classes, superior, middle, and inferior. And the superior class medicine, it was grains and vegetables and gentle herbs such as mint or, you know, um, the like that we could take every day without any ill effects and they always had a little description and most of them ends with and this prolongs life so their concern uh -huh. was more with having this harmonious nourishment and then you know middle class herbs were um, you know most medicinal plants that we use for intervention like for middle range illness like colds etc and then inferior class herbs were to rescue life and they, a lot of them are uh, herbs that are considered poisonous if um, if taken wrongly and just herbs that we use for you know either urgent disease or chronic diseases that are very deep um, and uh, yeah, yeah so those would be considered like the lowest category right <laughs> So it's really interesting, like to put the the Western mind and to start like opening up your uh, Chinese medicine mind. The most common things around you that is your primary medicine. That is that is considered the highest quality. And I would say, like in terms of qigong and um, some Taoist practices, like how you behave and the actions that you take in your daily life, your daily practice. It's not just about memorizing more and more Qigong. It's really about how your Qigong influences your daily life. And that's the path to true liberation, right? So the Qigong and Tai Chi or your herbal medicine formula, it's there to treat a certain thing or to learn a certain curriculum. And once you've learned it, then you can really just like embody that completely, make it your own, right? So this, this practice, like, so even when you're, you're practicing, you're taking your Qigong principles, um, even into something like drinking your cup of tea, right? So that your, your body is still in alignment while you're drinking your cup of tea. The choice, we're talking about herbal medicine, the choice of the tea that you're drinking is not gonna be one that sends your heart fire through the roof, but actually is something that helps to nourish your heart so that you feel more and more in the center and connected to the authentic place in your being. So you feel that place of balance. But in Western culture, we often feel like we have to, we need something to push against, or we need to win, <laughs> or we need to produce more, we need to make more money. You know, all of those, all of those ambitions can really bring us off of our center because we keep leaning out and we keep externalizing our, meta, our, our energy. And so you can see the highest level of, of medicine is really in the simple cultivation, the simple cultivation of our lives and our, and our daily lives, just breathing in and out, how we treat our neighbors, how, what we put in our mouths, right? All of these things, how we sleep at night. Oh, jean what, let's talk a little bit about sleep. Oh, sleep. Yeah. Well, sleep is very important. That's how we regenerate. And both, you know, Western and Eastern medicine agrees about this. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, in the summer, because there is more yang available, that can be a time when people who are prone to insomnia um, see a worsening of their insomnia because their energy has is riding on the world's energy and it has a harder time rooting um, than usual. Um, and also there's uh, more light out. The sun comes out earlier so that can 
wake somebody up if you're a light sleeper, that can be a problem. Um, so I, I would say having really good sleep hygiene um, and, and putting oneself to bed um, early is, is very important. And I need to take my own good advice on this. <laughs> nobody's perfect <laughs> but um, but that would be the recommended thing to make sure that, that you get enough sleep um, and is sleep how is sleep related to the heart organ well in an indirect way so the heart is the utmost yang organ in chinese medicine and the night is the time when yang returns inwards so you know you the sun rises um in the morning reaches the zenith somewhere around midday depending on you know um how well we synchronize with solar time and then um it, it, the sun sets and nadir that is to say the, the exact opposite place to the zenith um, during the night somewhere around midnight also depending on solar time and so when the sun is on the other side of the world it, it still exerts some kind of pull on us where uh, and that, that's how tides work actually and so mm -hmm. it anchors our yang so that our yang can go downwards and inwards in our body so you can observe in nature the flowers close even our eyes close everything wants to go inward at night if if, if we're on time with nature um, um, so how that's related to yang is because the heart is the center of human existence it is the first thing that is created when a baby is is made the heart starts beating and it is very interesting in that it is both a receptive organ that helps you go inward. It's the organ where you feel everything in your existence from. And it's also an effusive organ where with each beat, you generate blood flow and there's output there. So it can go, it can go both ways, but it is really important in order to be able to continue life that yang returns inward every night. And that, that's where, you know, calming the heart and maintaining good heart physiology where it's not, the heart fire is not flaring out of control like Sally and I have been talking about, uh, can really help you achieve a better night of sleep and better return of yang and therefore more longevity and health. Um, that answer that yeah so it's really important to even though the nature of yang is uh, outward and expressive it's important to direct yang inward so that you can actually restore yourself you can give yourself that time of restoration and unconsciousness at night um, and i mean this is something that uh, i was really happy to hear at the beginning of all of this um uh, COVID-19 health recommendations was that people were recommending to sleep more. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. was good. I, I was surprised that it was out there in mainstream media, but it, it yeah. was great. <laughs> yeah, you never hear that. You know, usually it's just like a contest to who can sleep the less and produce the most, right? It's like, yeah, and what pill you can that. take, etc. Be more awake, right? So it's like, yeah. um, actually the the doctors have have uh, finally given been given a little bit more voice in this in this moment and just recognizing like how important rest and sleep unconscious sleep and also um, I, also i would say just the ability to rest actively active rest i think is equally important so you're awake and maybe you're puttering around in the garden and you actually feel yourself being restored by that, or you're doing the ironing, or you're folding the laundry, or you're, you know, trimming somebody's hair because you know we all need a haircut nowadays. You know these these sort of things where you can be active, but you feel restful. You feel like your energy is returning to you in your, you know, quieting down. Yeah. And uh, Sally, I really liked what you said about, you know, um, needing less and, and um, just using what's available to us. Like, it doesn't cost anything to 
breathe and to appreciate deeply what you're doing and appreciate nourishment coming your way and eating simple foods and simple flavors. And one thing that came to mind when reflecting on that classification of, of herbs and with the superior and middle and lower level, mm. the people of that time didn't have very much available to, to them. The, you know, survival was an issue and it's a peril that's worth drawing in this time of quarantine where certain things are not available or hard to find. And the, the fact that simple foods are the superior way to go, simple meditation, just returning to the heart, the more simplicity, the better. Mm-hmm. But that's that's the hallmark of a wise people that's used to using resources wi- wisely and not um, over consuming and yeah. really seeing as precious things that are precious, such as med- medicine and um, other luxurious things that we're accustomed to, but are now maybe reconsidering in a new light. I hope. Yeah, I hope so, too. And it reminds me of what my teacher Liu Ming said. He's a Taoist priest. He's uh, no longer with us, um, but he would he would always say that the character of the heart is benevolence. That the heart itself doesn't need very much, just like a fire doesn't need that much, right? To be burning bright, it doesn't need something very complicated. It just needs a little bit of wood and a spark, and then boom, you've got fire, right? So it's like us. All we need to do is open our eyes up to the sun and the heart itself the heart organ you know all the blood that it receives it it keeps a little for itself but then all the rest gets pumped out to the rest of the territory to the rest of the of the uh, domain of your body right and then it returns to you returns to the heart it's replenished And then it's infused with like the spirit of the heart. The heart takes a little bit of nourishment for itself. And then boom, it goes out again to every single part of the body. Every single cell gets some. So that's the benevolence of the heart. It's not, it's not even a romantic idea. It's just practical. That's the job of the monarch of the system is to hold the spirit, be the residence of the spirit, take a little bit of nourishment from this earth, and then to spread the rest of the nutrition to the rest of the kingdom. That's this kind of um, the, the nature, the, the nature of the heart. So if we can return there and suddenly understand that we don't actually need a lot, but we need to identify what we need. And when those needs are met, we, we have a lot more to offer. That's so beautiful, Sally. Oh, thanks. Uh, so um, I just wanted to take some time for questions and answers. We have about yeah. 10, 15 yeah. minutes, if you're ready for that. I just wanted to bring your attention uh, to the chat window. Um, so if you go to the, if you open, go to the bottom bar of your, of your Zoom screen and open up the chat, um, I've put jean Viev's uh, website there and you can contact her through the website. Um, yeah, and maybe put yours too at some point. Yeah, so that I think so. I think so. some people may be really interested in getting your wonderful, wonderful Qigong um, treatment and instruction. Yes, I will definitely put my uh, information there too. And uh, if you have a question and you, you feel shy, you can type it into the chat. Um, but And you can also raise your hand if you go to... Uh, uh, where is it? The part, if you go to your name and you hover over the the blue thing, you can. Um, let's see. Is that where you have it? You can think- raise your hand if you know how to raise your hand. Otherwise, um, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to um, have people unmute themselves uh, and ask a question into the room. So, whoever has a question, you're welcome at this moment, one person at a time, to unmute yourself and ask a question into our shared space. So most of all, I wanted to say thank you. This has been fantastic. I'm so excited. What a treat to have both of you guys on the screen and hearing this amazing lecture conversation. So thank you so much. 
Our pleasure. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like I know a lot about the topic already and I learned so much and also just the context was fantastic. So really my question is, are you going to do this again? <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, so these Kung Fu tea talks um, in the past have, have been like a, a talk that I, that I've given uh, to patrons on Patreon, uh, members of the online learning site. Um, so sometimes it will be me answering questions from students. Um, and then I hope to be incorporating more guests into our Gung Fu Tea Talks. So I think it's such a, I, I mean, I just feel so lucky that I know so many amazing people in my life uh, through martial arts and cultivation and medicine. And just, I, I have so many amazing people that I know and I'd love to invite more guests into these talks as well so yes that is definitely a plan to do more of these and maybe we'll i would jean love to jean Viev will join us again in the future yeah so. of course i've been wanting to do this for a very long time and then i'm always so busy with clinic i feel like i start every year with this grand plan of having community classes of this nature and it just never happens because i'm too busy <laughs> No, I can relate exactly to what you're saying. So it's a great opportunity, you know, with every hardship, there's opportunity too. True. All right. Wendy, do you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, am I unmuted? I think I'm unmuted. Yeah. There you go. I can hear you. So, um, I also want to just say thank you. It's wonderful. And uh, I have two questions. Um, I live in Alaska. So... We're extremely extreme <laughs> when it comes to conditions, seasonal conditions. So we have really long light and everything is over the top. So my first question is, how do I extremely balance those extremes? <laughs> because they are really profound here. And the second is that um, because we do live in a place where we often go out and gather wild things because we live in a wild environment. Um, so are the things that are naturally appearing, um, the, I mean, they're naturally appearing because they're conducive to use at this time. Um, I mean, does, do those two things correlate with each other? So for example, right now we have, we've just been learning to harvest more. So we've been harvesting the tips of devil's club, which are, I don't know if I can say this right, Echinopanax heridium. They're extremely strong medicine, sort of. So um, just wondering about how to work with what's emergent and how to work with what's extreme in my environment. Great mm -hmm. questions. Um, so I, in terms of balancing the energies, I think that um, that happens naturally for you because when you do have winter, it's deep, 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 deep winter. <laughs> so I think... I'm imagining human beings who live in this kind of environment have such a greater bandwidth for expansion and contraction than, than those of us who live under, you know, milder climates. Um, so I actually here in Northern California, you know, yes. or in Northern California, the, the seasons can get a little mushy. That's right. Um, yeah. So I think unless you're having symptoms, um, that are bothersome, I wouldn't worry so much about it. And in terms of the food, that's a really, really deep question. And that's one that I've been thinking about for most of my adult life. You know, what causes certain plants to have certain properties? And how dependent is it on one, the characteristics of their environment, and two, the climate that they're uh, that they're growing in. And I think, um, you know, when we consider plants, we consider the things that are imparted to them by nature, being climate and environment, precipitation, things like that. But there's also, you know, uh, there's a, a fifth century BC philosopher named Dong Zhong Shu who used to talk about this very problem um, or this very question. And he used to talk about the inner nature of things and the inner nature in the seeds. So in other words, you know, under the same climate, you can have a plant that's relatively mild and you can also have extremely strong plants 
And I think the different lie, the difference lies in, um, again, that classification, you know, what is food and what is medicine? And the difference is if we define herbal or food substances or medicinal substances are as substances that have flavors and flavors moving chi and that affecting how our energy moves within our bodies. The difference between food and medicine would be that food is very gentle and it moves our energy, but it just moves it a little bit. In other words, like if you're at 6 a.m., you know, in your internal clock, if you take a medicine that is strong, like cinnamon, it can bring you to 9 a.m. immediately. But if you just have, you know, if you have just a teeny shake of pepper on your salad, it'll maybe just bring you out by 15 minutes, you know, metaphorically speaking. And, and so that's kind of where, where that is. And it's true that generally speaking, food, food plants will be appropriate in the season that they're appearing in. But not quite the same is true of medicine because of their very strong inner nature. So I hope that answers that. And I know it doesn't answer it completely. It's a Thank lifelong you. question. <laughs> Thank you. That's really helpful because I do think that Devil's Club is extremely medicinal. It is. Yeah. Um, it is. Yeah. And how lucky for you. It sounds amazing. <laughs> All right. So does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. This is Marty. Um, and I Hi. just, that, but I will say it verbally to, to thank you. It's a wonderful opportunity. Sally, I have not known you or your work and to have an introduction to you. And Geneviève, I've been your um, client patient for several years. And in both cases, just the having seeing these layers and layers and layers of the depth and the breadth of Chinese medicine. And I know it's just the tip of the iceberg of that philosophy, but, and, and your wisdom, how the two of you use it in your practices and your perspective on how it relates to, to life, to nature, to the pandemic. It's very beautifully woven together. And I feel really, really lucky to um, have this opportunity thank you oh thank you marty it, it's been such a joy to know you and all of you who are here well, you know none of this would have any meaning without people to share it with that's right thank you so much marty really appreciate that so I just want to thank everybody for being here at noon on a Thursday, whatever that means these days, Thursday, Wednesday, Saturday. But I really appreciate your presence. Um, it really helps uh, bring this all alive and bring more meaning to, uh, to our community. And I really want to thank Jean-Via for taking the time out and sharing in your wisdom. Um, this has been uh, such a great, fun opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. And, and we've had so many amazing conversations over the years. And um, I'm so glad that we can, we can share it with our friends here. It's wonderful, Sally. I've always felt like our views are so similar in Chinese medicine. And yet, I just learn so much every time I'm talking with you. So Me too. I thank exactly you. The same way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being a wonderful friend. Uh, you too. You too. Wonderful friendship. Um, thank you, everybody, for showing up. And I hope that you've um, maybe heard something that could add something to your life. And we'll be, um, you can look forward to the next one next month. And um, we'll talk about, well, I don't know what we'll talk about then, but I'll let you know. <laughs> we can figure it out. If you have we'll suggestions, email us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can always email us. We love, I mean, people think that we don't read emails and stuff, but actually uh, knowing what your thoughts and experience are, are really crucial for us to, to understand what it is that you're interested in. So, I mean, we can just talk amongst ourselves for forever, but it's actually very helpful to hear what you are interested in. So please do email us and let us know. 
and I'll see you on Patreon. This is a um, this was offered uh, freely to everybody. Uh, next month, uh, we'll be offering it to sustainable practice members and above, um, and Jean Vieve's uh, invitations as well. And these uh, talks will be recorded as well, so we'll be reposting it on Patreon. Okay, and then on the chat, I added the link to Patreon, the online learning site. And I also added a um, link to an upcoming Qigong workshop that I'll be offering June 1st through the 5th. I think some of you may have taken that class, but it's a, um, we'll be learning Qigong. It's designed like one hour of practice per day from eight to nine o'clock, followed by an optional question and answer period. So it's designed to help you instigate and support your own home practice and you'll learn a complete Qigong set at the end of it that you can, you can feel like you, you got your teeth into something and you can, you can explore that for yourself. So it's uh, five days, Monday through Friday, eight to nine, followed by question and answers. It's in collaboration with San Francisco Zen Center. Um, and the link is, uh, is on the chat window. So I hope some of you meet me there. And thank you, jean Vieve, so much. Thank all of you for being here. And we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and Sally, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank bye you, bye. Sally. Bye. Yeah. None of this would have any meaning without people to share it with. That's right. Thank you. <laughs>